Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Now every two years, right around the fall sometime, I have to complete a mandatory background check. I fill out a form, you know how these things go. I get Janice, our business office person, to write up the check. And off it goes in the mail to this group called the Oxford Document Manage Company. They're in Minnesota, I think in Faribault. And then after a month or two, the diocese, that's the kind of the umbrella organization over all the Anglican churches around here, they get a report about me, and it informs them about whether or not I've been caught committing any felonies, or if I've defaulted on any loans, or if generally I've done anything, quote, not befitting the office of the priesthood. Now, on the bright side, and I'm sure you'll be happy to know this, (laughs) I have passed my report. Thank you. I appreciate the applause, Jim. (laughs) Now, also on the bright side, I know this is nothing like the security checks that many of you here have as part of your lives in Northern Virginia. Now, on the not so bright side, the standard that all followers of Jesus Christ, not just the priests, are held to as a bit higher bar than just passing one of these simple background checks or even those clearances that we do here in Northern Virginia. And in fact, we hear that high bar, that standard, every Sunday when we come together at Epiphany. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And we also know it in the Ten Commandments right? And then Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The standard is high. And we, well, let's just be honest. We fall woefully short of this standard all the time. We would not want to get that report in the mail, would we? Hear me, this second Sunday of Advent, this John the Baptist Sunday, We are sinners. I'm a sinner. You are a sinner. Friends, we know. We know with what God requires of us. And guess what? We do not do it very well, do we? And sometimes, sometimes we have to face the fact that we do not even try to meet this standard. And not only do we not try to do what is required of us, more often than we care to admit, than I care to admit about myself, we positively do things that are actually forbidden by God. And worse than that, even worse than that, and I'm kind of going out on a limb here, but I think think you can all crawl out there with me, so to speak. (laughs) Worse than that, many of us can't even be bothered to confess and to ask forgiveness when we have sinned in these open and obvious ways against the clear commands of God. I mean, really, when is the last time that we actually confessed confessed a sin to God? I mean a specific sin. I don't mean that general confession that we say together every Sunday, and I think that's a great thing. But I mean a specific sin, something, something that we know we did or something that we know we did not do, how often have we brought that actual specific sin to God? Now, assuming that we cannot call to mind a lot of moments like that, and I know from my own life that's probably how it is, I don't like to think of my sins. I don't know about you, but I'd rather dwell on other things. I'd rather dwell on your sins. (laughs) and maybe you'd rather dwell on mine. (laughs) But assuming, assuming we cannot call that list to mind of our own specific, actual sins, and we cannot say that we have confessed them, this lack of repentance 
our lack of repentance. Friends, that's a flaw. That's a failing in our comfortable Christianity, in our cheap discipleship. You see, before Jesus can be our friend, and we do want Jesus to be our friend, he must be our Savior. It is our actual, specific sins, confessed and repented of, that must be brought into the open before God so that we can be saved from them and from their eternal consequences. As Martin Luther said in the very first of his 95 theses, you know, that long list of things he wanted to discuss with the Roman Catholic Church he put on the church door in Wittenberg. The very first of those is this. It's when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said repent, he wanted the whole life of believers to be a life of repentance. When our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said repent, he wanted the whole life of believers to be a life of repentance. Is my life a life of repentance? Is your life a life of repentance? Uncomfortable yet? <laughs> well, when it comes to pointing to our sin and calling for our repentance, I've laid this on about as thick as I can this morning. And I'm a lightweight when compared with John the Baptist. So let's look at him now. Turn to Matthew 3. This is page 808 in the Blue Bibles. Matthew 3, page 808. You see, John the Baptist does not mess around on this topic. Look at verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What Matthew says is that's the heart and the whole of John the Baptist's message. Repent. It's even the first word. He doesn't have a paragraph explaining it. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And not only is John the Baptist all about repentance from his very first word, but the people he calls to repentance, well, friends, they're may not who we would expect. They're not the people that we would necessarily think needed repentance. You see, it's not the outsiders. It's not the bad people. It's not the pagans. Of course, those people can repent as well. John's message of repentance is squarely aimed somewhere else. It's aimed at God's people. That's who responded as well. Look at verse 5 here in Matthew 3. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and the region about the Jordan. In other words, this is the heartland of Israel that comes out to John the Baptist. And then John, John gets even crazier about repentance. First, he calls insiders to repentance, not the outsiders. I mean, haven't they taken care of this already? Didn't they say the general confession in church last Sunday? And then what John does with those insiders he's gathered to him in the wilderness is he treats them like they're outsiders. How do I know that? Well, it's really simple, actually. I know that because John baptizes them. Now, that may not seem like a, like a connection. That may seem like I'm just wandering off in the distance here. But really, this is very clear. Because while we think of baptism as kind of a Christian thing, right? Something that we naturally do as a way to bring people into our community. Before it was our practice, before it was a Christian practice, it was a Jewish practice. And here's what I want to make sure we absolutely hear and realize when we read John the Baptist. This practice, this baptism that he did, this was a practice for non-Jews. It was for pagans outside God's people who were baptized at the time of John the Baptist. Friends, if you were a Jew and you went out to see the crazy guy with the locusts and wild honey in the wilderness and he told you that you needed to be baptized, well, that would border on insulting. That would be like going through customs at Dulles Airport, I'm sure one of our favorite experiences, and suddenly being told that your home, by your home country's representative that, well, yeah, we've got you on the list here, but you actually need to reapply for citizenship. That's a miraculous thing 
the miraculous thing is that people showed up and they did this. Jewish people from all walks of life were so convicted by John's call to repentance that they were even willing to be baptized, to go through the motions of applying for citizenship in a kingdom they already thought that they were a part of. Now, I'm not John the Baptist, so we're not going to end our service today by offering rebaptisms. <laughs> we get water all over the floor. <laughs> but I will say this. I pray that God would make us alive to our ongoing and personal need for repentance, even though we may already be followers of Jesus, just like so many Jewish people accepted their need for repentance at the time of John. Friends, our baptism when we were a baby or our personal profession of faith in Jesus as our Savior at summer camp when we were 14 or that Alpha course that changed our lives when we were 40. Those things are not the end of our repentance. They're the beginning. Remember Martin Luther's first theses on that Wittenberg floor when our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, said, repent. He wanted the whole life of believers to be a life of repentance. Now, you might be tracking with me so far. I mean, John's words are challenging, yes, but this passage comes around at least once a year here at Epiphany. And those of us who are serious about the Bible and are serious about our faith, we aren't surprised to learn that there is such a prominent place for repentance in the life of Christians. I mean, a few of us may even have regular patterns of confession. A couple of us may even have a confessor, someone that we go to to be assured of God's mercy. We might seem to have this mastered. It may seem like old hat. Oh, friends, if John the Baptist had anything to say, to any of us who are satisfied practitioners of the mechanics of religion, even the mechanics of repentance in our tradition as Christians. It is this. Look at verse 7. Look at these hard words. You brood of vipers who warned you to flee the wrath to come. This is what the kids call real talk. Because, friends, the people he's speaking to, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're exactly this. They are exactly satisfied practitioners of religion. And here's the thing that I want us not to lose, is they're like us. We love to talk about the Pharisees and Sadducees as the example of what not to be, right? And that's true. None of us should aspire to to do what we see Pharisees and Sadducees doing in Scripture. At the same time, at the same time, there are connections. There are many connections between us and them. I think this is especially true of the Pharisees. We love to pick on the Pharisees, and often they deserve it, particularly if you read the Gospel accounts. They seem to so often get the wrong end of the stick, right? But Pharisees at their best Pharisees at their best actually have a number of traits that sound a lot like evangelical Christians. I mean, just listen to these things. Pharisees, to start with, were very serious about Scripture. Pharisees were the ones that investigated to figure out how much of the spice in their kitchen cabinet needed to be tied. You don't do that if you don't care about Scripture. And Pharisees, they attempted to live lives of personal holiness. They knew that what they did mattered in their day-to-day -day life. So much that they came up with rules about which kind of silverware they should use in particular occasions. And not only that, but Pharisees had little use for religion, i.e. the temple in their case, as an institution, and instead focused on an individual's personal relationship with God. So seriousness about scripture, lives of holiness, relationship with God. Sound familiar? Sound like us? And their example, their example warns us 
that even these good things, and they are good things, I'm glad we pursue these things here at Church of the Epiphany, well, they can lead us astray if they are not joined at the hip to authentic and ongoing repentance. So that's the Pharisees. There's some similarities we need to notice and take seriously, even though it makes us squirm a little bit. The Sadducees are a bit different. The Sadducees, friends, they're me. They're the institution. They're the clergy. Their members were priests at the Jerusalem temple. Now, this is the part I hope is not me. But they knew the law forward and backwards, but didn't care nearly so much as the Pharisees about personal holiness or personal belief. You see, if the Pharisees were the evangelicals of Jesus' day, the Sadducees, well, they, they were the religious leaders. They were even, maybe you would call them the mainline religious leaders. And guess what? Just like today, those groups don't always get along so well. I'm really regretting saying they were me as I moved through this. I didn't have that in my original text. Um, I didn't realize how hard I was on them until now. But I'll say this. They are the leaders. They're the leaders of the community. Um, and in fact, uh, if anything, they might be more like you would think of as, as a mainline leader, one of the mainline churches. But what we need to see here in John the Baptist is they all, they all come under this word of warning. All religious insiders, Pharisees and Sadducees, the Jewish evangelicals and the mainliners, they fall under this same judgment. You brood of vipers. Both Pharisees and Sadducees are challenged to the same sort of change if they really, truly want to be in good standing in God's kingdom. That kingdom that John is announcing is just right around the corner. Look at verse 8. This is what they're called to. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That is, don't argue over the jot and tittle in the scripture. Change your lives, Pharisees and Sadducees, so that they line up with things that God values. Change your lives, evangelicals and mainliners, so that they line up with the things we know God values. And then, and then stop hiding behind the shield of your citizenship in God's people as though that is enough. Listen to what John says. And do not presume to say for yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. I actually think this is the key to what John is doing when he's taking all these insiders, all these Jewish people and taking them through the outsider process of baptism. He is saying, we need to make a new people of God. And everyone has to choose to enter it. There is no, no automatic pass into God's kingdom, not even, not even for God's people. My goodness. If we take John the Baptist seriously, and I believe we must. This is challenging stuff isn't it? It seems like there is no safe ground for us to rest upon our laurels, is there? The only approved preparation for God's visitation in Jesus Christ is personal and ongoing repentance. And this is not a repentance for those who know themselves to be outside of God's people, or today those outside God's church, but for those of us inside. And finally, no matter who we are, Anglicans, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Protestants, or Catholics, mainline or evangelical, we all fall under this call for repentance. God's Messiah is coming. As John says, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Merry Christmas. <laughs> now I could end right here this morning and I would have preached what I hope is a faithful sermon on John the Baptist on Matthew 3 verses 1 through 12. And we are really meant to hear this forceful call to repentance this Advent season. But as we follow it, 
as we repent, I would never want us to forget that the kingdom that John ran in front of announcing has actually arrived, friends. And it arrived not dealing flames and death and destruction on God's enemies or even on unrepentant insiders like we may tend to be. But it arrived in gentleness and with mercy and forgiveness. I love what Paul says about Jesus' ministry in Romans 15, which we also heard this morning. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that is, to the insiders, to show God's truthfulness, and, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his what? For his mercy. John forcefully calls both insiders and outsiders to repentance. Yes. But insiders and outsiders find that mercy meets their repentance in the person of Jesus Christ, God's Messiah. If following Jesus were a dance, it would always be a two-step, friends. The first step is always this clarion, crystal, clear call to repentance. We have sinned. We have sinned by our own fault. And it must be named and brought into the open. This is a required step. And John the Baptist forcefully reminds all of us this morning that it cannot be skipped, whether we are insiders or outsiders. But the second step is God's response to our sin, which in Jesus Christ is grace and mercy for sinners. Our repentance in God's mercy over and over again. As John says, as John says, one is coming after me who is mightier than I. May we meet that mighty and merciful Jesus Christ in our personal and ongoing repentance this Advent season. Amen.